Um, I'm very excited today that we have um, our Dr. Frank W. Perry lecture speaker here. This is Dr. Martin Fritz from Cornell University. Um, and so he's going to give us a horticulture lecture as part of this seminar series. And I'm going to ask um, the first Ms. Juniper to introduce it. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Fritz, who is a professor in horticulture at Cornell uh, within the School of Integrative. Uh, plant sciences. He's also the director of undergraduate studies for SIPS, and he also served as chairman for the department for 13 years, from up until 2015, I guess, when SIPS was started. Um, Dr. Fritz's educational background, he got his bachelor's from Bucknell University in biology, a master's from the University of South Carolina, also in biology, and finally, his PhD from Michigan State University in horticulture. Um, in addition to being an expert in small fruits and berries, especially raspberries and strawberries like green here today, um, Dr. Fritz is also really heavily involved and passionate about teaching and extension, believing that we as scientists in agriculture have responsibility to all citizens to better educate and inform them regarding issues of food, choice, safety, um, and also sustainability. So with that, please help me introduce her. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I've never been to the campus before. I've uh, been to Illinois, of course, many times, and uh, I used to work with a fellow named Bill Forker, who many of you might recognize that name, uh, Bob Skirvin and Alan Otterbacher, but anytime we've met, it's always been off campus, not on campus. So yesterday afternoon, I had a chance to walk around and enjoy the campus, and it's really impressive with the trees that you have here, the specimens are really remarkable, but, uh, but nothing's labeled. So for me, to see some of those oaks, and I didn't know what they were, I think a really good idea would be to have an arboretum walk on your campus, where people could walk and see some of the labeled trees and have a little map. I think it'd be really cool. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about uh, sustainable fruit production, particularly related to strawberries and maybe uh, raspberries and blackberries, depending on how much time we have. So about a year ago, I was asked to uh, write a chapter for a book on sustainable fruit production. So the book was on sustainable fruit production, and the uh, editor wrote and said, we really want someone to write the chapter on strawberries, and would you do it? And I thought about it for a while, and I got back to him and I said, you know, I don't think you can possibly write a book on sustainable strawberry production because <laughs> strawberries just aren't grown sustainably. <laughs> and I said, I'll write a chapter on unsustainable strawberry production for you. <laughs> and he goes, okay, you gotta do it. Uh, because the strawberry industry has changed so much from the way it used to be to how it's grown today. And in many ways, I think it is unsustainable trying to come up with solutions to make it more sustainable without losing some of the uh, qualities that the strawberry industry has today, like strawberries almost year-round. So that's what I wanna sort of think about and talk about today. So to put things in perspective, uh, yeah, I'm moving to, <laughs> So to put things in perspective, I thought like we come to Illinois, uh, let's talk about the strawberry industry itself. And so I have, you know, how many acres of corn you supposedly have and how much it's worth and soybeans. And what about strawberries in the United States? Not in Illinois, in the United States. What's well, so someone want to guess what the these numbers might be? How many acres, what the value is? Annual farm gate value? Acres, anybody want to make a wild guess? 15,000 acres. 15,000 acres across the United States. And we also make a guy. It's a little low on the left side. 50,000 is really close, yeah. Right, so about 55,000 acres. And about half those acres are in California. The rest are spread around the rest of the country. What about farm gate value? How much is it worth, do you think, to an order of magnitude? Billion dollars. Uh, how much? A billion. A billion dollars. Anybody else? Five billion. Five billion, yeah. So it's 3.4 right now. That's farm gate value. And then 
generally they're sold at about twice the price of the farm gate value. So about $6 billion a year of strawberry activity. So that's, that's quite a lot. That's a lot more than most people think. But if you go back 70 years ago, things weren't like that. All across the country, everybody was growing short day varieties in perennial matted rows. What that means is they would take the strawberry plants, they would plant them in the spring. The plants would grow through that first year and make runners. Then they would go through the fall and experience short days and cool temperatures. They would initiate flowers. Those flowers would go through the winter. And then in the spring, when it warmed up, they would flower. You got one big crop of fruit. And then the days were long by then, so the plants are back to runner production. And if you kept the plants in the ground, you get another crop the next spring, another crop the next spring. So it was a pretty short season. Three, four, five weeks, and that was about it. And that was true all across the country, everywhere. California, Florida, everywhere. So then what happened in the 1970s was there was a breakthrough uh, by a man named Royce Brinkhurst, who was a California strawberry breeder, who found some uh, plants growing at high elevation in the Wasatch Mountains of Utah that were doing their thing under long days. Because up in the top of the mountains, when the growing season is amenable to growth, you only have long days. And he remembered as a boy hiking up there that there were strawberries. So he said, well, there must be something different about those strawberries. They can't be like short day plants and they wouldn't be able to ever fruit. So he took those plants, crossed them with some of the California varieties at the time. He got these plants that were insensitive to day length. They flowered and fruited under all day length. That was a big breakthrough for strawberry growers because now instead of just having strawberries for a limited period of time, you can start to plant them and fruit them over much longer periods of time. So that really helped extend the growing season in California from the same time, four or five weeks to like over several months. And that really allowed them to start to, to capture the market. There was a breeding program in California, obviously there was one in the East. The, mostly that was led by a fellow named Gene Galetta, who was convinced that to be sustainable in growing strawberries, you have to breed varieties that are resistant to all these soil pathogens that we have in this wet, cool climate. So you've got to breed strawberries. We can't release a variety that doesn't have good soil resistance. Royce Bringhurst in California said, heck with that, that's too many genes to bring along. We're going to forget about breeding for resistance. We're just going to fumigate it every year. We're going to grow these as annuals. We're going to fumigate. And we're going to focus on size and shipping quality, and we're going to figure out everything else. So they completely changed the focus of their program, and the east went one direction, and the west went in another direction. The, in the west, in California, like I said, they annually fumigated, they used plastic mulch, and they used these fresh bug condition plants that they found were really the key to extending the season over a longer period of time. And what they do in California is they, their strawberries go through three places they're grown before they actually produce fruit. Unbelievable. So they start in these low elevation nurseries in the hot Central Valley where it's hot. And under hot conditions, strawberry plants make runners. So they start with the variety they want, they grow it in the Central Valley, produces all these runners under these hot, long day conditions but they won't make flowers there. So they have to dig them up, transport them to the mountains at high elevation, grow them there, then they dig them up, and then they initiate flowers there. Then they dig them up and plant them along the coast where it's cool and they produce fruit. So they have low elevation nurseries for runners, high elevation nurseries for initiation, and then coastal sites for fruit production. So it's a complicated system, but by using a combination of different cultivars, different digging dates, different amounts of chilling and planting dates and field locations, it can pretty much cover the whole year. It's remarkable. So the varieties change. This is a 20 year trend in what varieties are grown. But this is what's happened to the peak in strawberry production, say, over the last 20 years. So at one point, California was pretty much like us, let me go back here. My word grow. Anyway, you can see the peak there from 77 to 79. Strawberries were concentrated in just a few months of the year. Now it's flattened out. 
And today, in 2018, it's really flat. There's only a couple of months of the year that California doesn't produce strawberries, and Florida produces strawberries then. And they use basically the same system as California, except where do they get their plants? Because it's too warm in, in Florida to grow strawberries year-round. They don't initiate flowers. Where do you think they get their plants? California. Mm -hmm. Canada. So they get shipped out from Canada. So but it's an annual system, so it's really, really intensive. And back in California, you know, over the time, their yields have gone up tremendously per acre. The acreage itself has gone up. And just a few pictures from California. Let's see what some of these fields look like. This is not Southern Illinois, it's California. <laughs> and so now they have 90% of their strawberry production on 50% of the acreage, 20% uh, of the world production, 3 billion pounds produced, so forth. Their yield, 60,000 pounds per acre. Most other states, around 11 to 12,000 pounds per acre. So they really, they really nail it. <coughs> but, um, so this is the trend in strawberry yields in California. See it going up and up and up. Florida is in between, and then here, the rest of us down here, a little over zero, we're like trudging along there, we haven't really seen any big increases. So, one of the things we wanted to do is find out why aren't we seeing increases in yield that are similar to what California and Florida are seeing. So, one of the nice things about strawberry is it's clonally propagated, and there's a germplasm repository where all this plant material is stored, so you can go back to the repository, you can get varieties that were grown you know, in the past and, and have them there today to look at. So what we did, we went back and we got the two most popular strawberry cultivars in the Northeast of each decade starting in the 1890s. And we planted them in a common garden and then we looked and see how they were performing when everything was the same, same fertility, same irrigation schedule, a whole bit, to see if there were any trends over time. And this is the trend. It's kind of flat. It's not really increasing. In fact, you can make a case lately that you know the yields have actually been going down in some of the more recent releases. We have seen increases in berry size. The berries are getting larger. Both the primary fruits coming off and the secondary and so forth fruit. That's increasing. The number of marketable fruit per plant is decreasing, and firmness has gone up, and those are things we could expect, but we really haven't seen this big increase in yield. Again, probably because the eastern strategy has been to make sure that when you release a variety, it's somewhat tolerant to soil pathogens, and when you bring along all those genes in an octopoid plant, which is really hard to breed for, it's really hard to make rapid progress, instead of just concentrating on a couple of traits. So you could argue that the Western strategy won out. Forget about all this other stuff, just focus on yield and size and go for it. Fumigate everything else, annual system, moving these plants all around, and that's the way to go. But you know, what does that say about sustainability? In the East, you know, the big breakthrough was like, oh, we can use row covers for our plants and that will help them in the spring to get an earlier start. And it does increase yield somewhat, but it hasn't had the same sort of uh, major impact on production that California strawberry growers have figured out. So that's a nice field in the east, but it's still quite a bit lower yield potential than what's out west. So northern strawberries, including us here, low yield, harvest in four or five weeks. Um, California system, high yields, extended season. Which system is more sustainable? And I mean, you could probably make arguments for either one. You'd say, well, California, obviously, because they get those really high yields, and economically, you know, there's no question that they're sustainable. And they persisted in producing for many decades now, and they capture almost the entire market in the United States. So that's got to be more sustainable. On the other hand, you can say, well, they use so many inputs that the Northeast and Midwest is more sustainable, even though the yields are lower, because they don't have to use quite as many inputs. In California, in Florida, so forth, there's all these inputs at all these various stages of production, where in the Northeast there are far fewer. Just one more thing that I didn't tell you 
whenever these plants are taken from the high elevation nurseries down to the fruiting fields, or they're taken from Canada and they're planted in Florida, they're dug right now. This is the time of the year that they're dug. And they're planted in Florida, and this is what the plants look like right after they plant them. They're taking plants right out of the ground, bare rooted, shipping them down there, sticking them in the ground on black plastic. So it's kind of it's hot. It can be hot this time of year, right? Um, so what do you have to do to these plants to get them to establish? What are you going to have to do? Water them. All right. So how many gallons of water are used in the first two weeks per acre of these plants? Do you want to make a guess? Let's do it in, in gallons, because I don't know if it's a room. <laughs> <laughs> what, a thousand gallons? Uh, we have a vote for a thousand gallons. More than, more than that. Yeah, it's more than that. Ten. Ten thousand. So I hear more. <laughs> it's going, going once, twice. Five hundred thousand gallons of water per acre to get these things established. All right? So that's just incredible. So. We can compare the input used between the perennial system and the annual system. You know, the nurseries are planted based on two different kinds of nurseries in the annual system. They're using the susceptible cultivar to irrigation, annual planting, plastic mulch, over here irrigation for two weeks after planting. The nitrogen rates, around 400 pounds per acre, we're using around 100. They have to use frequent button decide applications in Florida where it's warm, you know, they use twice a week, they have to apply fungicide. And there's a big reliance on undocumented workers to pick that fruit, and the markets are pretty far away. So, is it sustainable or not? So, in writing this book chapter, I wanted to figure out how much energy is expended to produce and deliver the equivalent amount of energy in the fruit. You know, I said again, how much energy do you put in to get the same amount of energy out. Is it one to one? Is it five to one? You know, there's uh, this argument about, you know, biodiesel and ethanol. Is it one to one? You know, is as much energy you go in as come out? So you could argue, at least in the ballpark, it's kind of maybe one to one. What's the ratio in strawberry, do you think? Four to one. Ten to one. Four to one, ten to one. So, so there's some life cycle analyses. Uh, California production emits 1.75 kilograms of CO2 for each kilogram of fruit. A nursery operation is 6% more. Packaging uses a half a kilogram per kilogram of fruit. Uh, almost one kilogram of CO2 to transport a kilogram of fruit to the East Coast. Bottom line, you put that all together, it's 15 times. So 15 times energy invested in a strawberry to get that one unit of energy back on the table along the East Coast. So, not very sustainable. So the question that we're working on is can we take the best parts of that annual plasticulture system and adopt it to the Northeast and Midwest conditions where you know, land's less expensive? You know, land in California is like a million dollars an acre. Soils here are more fertile, the water is abundant, and consumers are close by. So that's what we are trying to do with some of our research. And we're using uh, northern day neutral, northern day neutral strawberry production, but we're using the California varieties. Don't tell them. But we're using their varieties <laughs> because their varieties are really pretty good. And if you do some things and some tricks to them, you can get them to grow really well here in the Midwest and the Northeast. So we're using their varieties. And you know, believe it or not, if you let a California strawberry Ripen fully? It's pretty good. <laughs> the problem is, you know, they're picking them three or four days before they're fully ripe and putting them on a trailer truck and shipping them across the country. And when we get them, there's no more, there's no starch in the strawberries, so there's no opportunity for that starch to break down into sugar like there is in an apple. So you get what you get when you pick it. But the variety is pretty good. So here are some fields in the Northeast that are using these systems. This is in the fall of the year. They're using black plastic and they're using the day neutral varieties. But with a little bit of a twist, so a typical day neutral strawberry, this is the ones that are unsensitive to daylight, uh, they produce a lot of fruit in the um, first year 
and that fruit is coming in right now, August, September, October, then it falls off before winter. But if you hold them over, you get another peak of fruit in the second year in the springtime. That sometimes can be a good bit of fruit. So you don't want to necessarily grow them just for one season and then take them out, although you could. But if you can hold them over winter and fruit them in that second spring, you get a pretty good crop, then you can take them out. So that's sort of the system we're thinking about. And added to that, if you can put a plastic tunnel over top of these plants, you can really have them fruit quite late into the fall. And the nice thing about tunnels is you can raise them and lower them to adjust the temperature. And that, coupled with these big neutral varieties, really have the potential of extending the season in an area of the country where the consumers are, where there's lots of water, and land's cheap. These are going in matted rows? These are not in matted rows. No, these are on annual raised bed systems planted at high density. The day neutral plants do not run her very much. So you kind of have to plant them at a high density to begin with, just like they do in California. So these are some of our tunnel plots. Uh, this is in November. This is in Ithaca, New York. We have snow on the ground, and we're picking strawberries. Pretty remarkable. These tunnels cut out mildew. They cut out gray mold. You get none of that into the tunnels, really. This is what some of the systems look like in our research plots. We can raise the tunnel up on one side and leave it open. And then when it's going to rain, we can just go along and pull it down. Or in the fall, we can lower it when it's going to get frosty at night. And you can see the leaves are there really clean. No diseases, no powdered mildew. That's what it looks like. And uh, yeah, this is my dining room table a couple of years ago in yeah. November. Yeah, pretty nice. So we did a whole bunch of standard horticultural experiments to try to figure out how can we get the system to work. Uh, standard cultivar trials with and without covers. And you know, we've looked at these California varieties. We looked at the yield in a tunnel, the percent of fruit that's marketable in the open percent of fruit that's marketable. We almost always see higher yields in tunnels than out of the tunnels, and always a higher percentage of marketable fruit in the tunnel than outside the tunnel. What's the spacing on these? So the spacing on these, we have five foot centers between rows, but each row is a double row. And the plants are staggered in that double row, a foot apart, down, and then the stagger is also a foot, or nine inches, somewhere between nine and 12 inches. So 20% higher yields overall, 50% higher marketable fruit. Uh, if you hold them over into the second year, they could have a cold, wet spring. Those covers can make a huge difference in that second year crop in the spring. In this case, we got, almost, we got more than double the yields under the tunnels and a lot higher marketable fruit. Because springtime can be really nasty, as you all know. Uh, rain, snow, wind, uh, then warm again. So. So do you leave the covers on in the winter or do you put straw? No, so in the winter, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that. But so what we do is we take the, the, the plastic and we fold it down and then we mulch with straw for the winter. Yeah, and we have a whole separate experiment on how to do that. We've looked at different varieties, uh, looked at average fruit weight, and there's some real differences here. This is Seascape. This is an older variety of California day neutral. And you can see that during the year, the fruit size fluctuates quite a bit. These are some separate treatments. But you know, some of them, like Albion, the fruit size is real consistent through the year. Nice big fruit all the way through. So we like Albion, by the way. That's a variety that we've kind of chosen as our go-to. The new variety is nice, large, and it tastes really good. It's not always the highest yield, but when you let it fully ripen, it tastes good. Uh, we looked at planting dates, like when's the optimal time to plant. Looked at four planting dates. And you can see the experiment here where we've got plants at different stages because they're planted at different times. And earlier you plant, so April, May, late May, mid June, the yields go down. So the early planting date's the best. And in the same way with seascape, the early planting date's the best. And there, again, the remarkable thing is that the marketable fruit is very high, the unmarketable fruit is just a small percentage of that at the top. 
And we did the same experiment in Geneva, and the same thing. The earlier you can get these plants in the ground, uh, the better they do. So just a piece of information for growers. Another question on plastic type. What's the best plastic to use? So you're all familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum, the piece of visible light here that we can see and that plants use. Uh, this is, and, and most plants, of course, respond to the visible spectrum, but some of the fungi actually have their action spectra at wavelengths that we can't see. And detritus is one of those. It's a fung common fungus, gray mold, and its action spectra is actually in the ultraviolet range. So where visible light starts right here, it goes up. You know, the, the ultraviolet light is down in that area. That's where the detritus has its activity. So if you can cut off ultraviolet light, those detritus spores don't germinate. So some of these plastics are designed so they shut out ultraviolet light. So this one in particular, down here in the ultraviolet range, there's very little ultraviolet light coming through, and that is inhibitory to detritus. And then we have visible light where we want it, and then we also kind of want to shut down infrared, because that's the heat waves, and we don't want the plants to get too hot. Strawberries don't like too much heat. So we can block those infrared rays that keeps the plants cooler. And then in the fall, when we want to keep the heat in and we cool this plastic down, the infrared block coming up the other way. So there's been some technology in plastics that help us as well. I'm doing a, a project with folks from Penn State, New Hampshire, and Michigan State, and we're looking at all these as an SCRI grant. And the bottom line is that these plastics uh, work pretty well, particularly relative to no chemicals at all. Uh, here's some different plastics and how the plants perform into those plastics. The big difference in a lot of these plastics is out here at the end where uh, it's fall and you can see these plastic cover plots are still cranking away. They're pretty good fruit even in, in November where the one that's not covered to control is down low. So that's where they really make a difference in late fall. Another question growers would ask is how much fertility do they need? How do you have to fertilize them? Unlike a regular June strawberry, you put fertilizer on usually after their harvest is over, what we call renovation time, and then maybe a little bit in the fall. These day neutrals have very shallow root systems. They need to be spoon fed nitrogen, so they have to be fed every week. That can give them a little bit of nitrogen. This is our trial to figure out how much that is. We run it for a couple of years, but generally we find that around five pounds of actual nitrogen per week per acre is what these plants require to optimize their production. And then, back to your question about overwintering, these plants are not the toughest plants in the world because they're from California, they're not used to you know, northeast winters. And we really want to get that second harvest there if we can. So we put in the first year, overwinter them, and get this second harvest. So how do we do that? So we put in a trial where we uh, looked at a no mulching, just leave these plants out in the open. We mulched them earlier than we normally would mulch strawberries with straw. A normal mulching time, which would be around December 1st. We used row cover for winter protection, the fourth treatment. So that's a floating row cover. It's not straw, it's not opaque, it's visible, light can still go through, but it provides some protection. And then we deflowered plants at a couple of different dates. One of our concerns of why these things weren't overwintering very well was that we're fruiting them right up until November, and then as soon as we get that last fruit off, we're covering them with straw, and it's dark under there until spring. We take the straw off, and we say, okay, go ahead and perform. And they're like, oh my god, I just fruited up until last minute, then you made me dark all winter long. I couldn't photosynthesize, and now you're asking me to pump out fruit. And they just weren't doing it. They weren't even sometimes surviving. So we thought, well, maybe we cut off that fruiting season a little short in the fall, give them a chance to build up some carbohydrate before going into winter, they'll survive a little bit better. And then the last treatment was some foliar urea sprays. If you spray foliar urea on a plant, it requires carbon structure to take up and assimilate that nitrogen. So you, basically, when you fertilize in the fall like that, you drive down your nitrogen carbon levels in the plant. So not that we would do that, but it was a way to test the hypothesis that maybe carbon was playing a role. And if it is, we expect that plants under that last treatment not to do very well because they were having to use a carbon to assimilate that nitrogen rather than form starch. 
So this is the planting, and this is in the spring. After you overwinter, the plants, yeah, look very good. You know, but you know, some plants, you know, still green leaves there, they're gonna grow just fine. Other plots, you know, almost everything was dead. So these are data on fall plants that were alive going into the fall. You know, there's no difference in the treatments because we didn't really apply treatments at that point. These are in the springtime coming out of it. These are the plants that are alive. And the worst was this treatment here where we did this weekly urea sprays. Uh, that just drove carbohydrate levels down so low the plants didn't survive. Number four was pretty bad too. Uh, covering with straw on November 15th, about two or three weeks before you normally would. Again, putting plants in the dark sooner than they needed to be. That wasn't so good. Uh, and the plant that did the best, right here, you know, number three, the row cover that allows light to come through. And then the ones where we remove flowers early to give them a chance to build up carbohydrate. So we're pretty sure that it's carbon uh, going into the winter is important for these plants. Average markable weight of fruit in the spring, same pattern that we see as we saw before. Uh, well, at least, you know, the ones that did the best were the ones where we remove the flower a little bit early, give them a chance to build up some carbohydrate, they do better in the spring. So when did you put the urea? The urea was started October 1st and every week through October, November. They received foliar urea, 5%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we would not recommend. <laughs> <laughs> I know. How many yeah. did you do this weekend? How many did you flower? Pinch. Just pinch. Yeah. How many flowers per plant do you get? You, you pinched the, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but you pinched the whole truss, so you're getting yeah, seven yeah. or eight flowers at a time. Yeah, it's not, it's not terrible. So let's go back to our question about sustainability, input comparisons, northern tunnels versus like California, Florida, angle plastic culture. Plastics and drip tape, yeah, we're using those. Not great, but that's what we have right now. Same varieties in both. Uh, we're using tunnel plastic, which adds an element of unsustainability to it and lower yields. But all these other factors, you know, we're not using fumigation, we're not using a lot of water, we're not using a lot of fertilizer, and the transportation costs, the consumers are right there. What would labor So labor would be, I think it would probably be about the same. I don't really see a big difference in labor between the two systems, because most of the labor is in picking the fruit, and so you're, you're picking the fruit by hand in either case, so. That's the defoliator, deflowering. Oh, well, I, yeah, we didn't factor that in, but that's, at this point, we're just, this is just data, just new data. So we might recommend that in the future. But that would be, a, yeah, that would be another added cost that, you know, California grower wouldn't have. And probably another cost would be, you know, putting up those tunnels, which isn't too time consuming, but it's an extra cost. <coughs> Good point. And so we put all this together in a strawberry production guide that you can download for free uh, at this site at Tunnel Berries. This is a collaborative SCR project that we're all working on. Another uh, project I'm working on, I'm just going to show you one slide on this. And this is really cool. I'm also involved in a project on powdery mildew control in strawberries. And this is a really bad problem, particularly in Florida. And so uh, this project here is found that certain wavelengths of ultraviolet light inhibits powdery mildew, like it just stops it cold in its tracks. And so we're developing this machine, a prototype that you can drive across your strawberry field at night, and it's, plants are exposed to just three seconds of UVC it, once a week, you don't get powdery mildew. It's really remarkable. So we think that's you know another step towards sustainability so you're not spraying fungicide, you're just running this machine over the rocks. Yeah, my, I, I don't know about pumpkins. <laughs> it's hard to run over the rows of pumpkins, but strawberries have nice rows. So. <laughs> Maybe you need like a drone or a helicopter. It's not your life. And then, uh, yeah. So I wanted to also just show you some of the work we've been doing on uh, high tunnels for raspberries and blackberries. And you know, these high tunnels, give us a lot of advantages. If you go to certain parts of the world, they grow their plants under high tunnels strictly for the fact that it keeps the fruit from getting damp with the fog in the morning. And so it's worth it to them that California, they grow lots of raspberries under tunnels, not because of temperature, 
and not necessarily because of rain, because I don't get much, but they get a lot of fog in the morning, and keeping that off the plants and the fruit, particularly, is worth it to them. It's cheap insurance. And here, where we live, we not only get that moisture and the rain, but we get a lot of wind, and these tunnels can cut down on the wind, and also it can help us modify the temperature and help us extend the season. So, this, oh, back up. this photo here is in California, and you can see that the ends aren't even shut because all they're concerned about is keeping moisture off the fruit, not the temperature management. So we've looked at different ways of trying to grow these raspberries in tunnels, and uh, we looked, took a couple of different strategies. One is to take a fall fruiting raspberry, and normally what will happen is you plant these fall fruiting raspberries, they send up canes, and those canes initiate flowers in the middle of summer, and then they fruit in the fall. So right now, you'd be picking fruit off of these canes. Then they kind of stop uh, producing fruit, particularly when it gets cold. Now, I don't know about here, but our average day of first frost is October 5th. That's just like now. And you know, here it's like it's midsummer. But that's when we normally get a frost, and that stops your production. So these plants just start getting going, and then the frost comes, and the production stops. So that's too bad. But if we can put a tunnel over these plants, that first frost doesn't make any difference. Those plants just you know, keep on going. So this would be a great way to extend that season into the fall. And the other thing, since you already have the tunnel up, why not even delay fruiting even more so, so that you can even go later than what the plant would naturally be inclined to do. So we've done some work where we found that if you take these first year canes, these primate canes as we call them, and pinch the tips and get them to branch a little bit, that delays fruiting. So here we have a row of plants that have not been pinched, and here we have a row of plants that have been pinched. They're a little bit shorter, and they also are about two weeks delayed in their fruiting. So we can go into these tunnels, in this case here, October 20th, and we've got a full house of fruit. Outside, we'd be done. But inside, we're still picking. And if you take half of that planting and you pinch the tips of half of it, and not the other half, that first half you did pinch is producing fruit, great guns now, and then another week or so, that half you pinched is going to come in. And you can really spread your season out. The bumblebees, we, we were really worried about pollination because once frost comes, you don't see very many bees around. We found out that bumblebees don't like to die from cold either, and so they <laughs> flock into the, green, into the tunnel. They flock into that tunnel. It's amazing. Look how many bumblebees, it's like one of those contests. How many bumblebees in this photo? There's probably 10 or more in there. They just love it in there. And so pollination is not a problem, even in that, this time of year. And the yields are, are really very good. And if it does get really, really cold, like this sometimes whenever it's like 20th of October, it's gonna get really cold that night, into the 20s. You can cover your plants inside that tunnel with like a row cover for just that night. <coughs> just get them through that night because you got another three or four weeks where you can be picking fruit and take it off and keep going. So the pinching is done early spring? Pinching, no, the pinching is done when the plants are about this fall. So June. June will be about the right time. So this is uh, I mean, weeks after August 22nd. Anyway, this is getting into September and into October. And this arrow here, this is like October 5th. This is when the normal season kind of ends. And this blue line is a control and you can see it's just getting started almost at its peak. And then in most years, it gets cut off. And so you miss all this fruit out here. But if you're in a tunnel, you pick up this fruit out here. So you almost double, you almost double your yields by having a tunnel. And then if you pinch, you shift that production peak even later in the fall, like this green line right here, and uh, you can get fruit later. So that's a way of spreading out that season. Another thing you can do is try to bring your crop in at the early side. So you've got a tunnel, and you can put even a row cover in the tunnel over top of the plants when they start up. So you kind of get both the tunnel protected, the row cover protected in the spring, and really get these plants off to a fast start in the spring. And so Jenny's in the field, no tunnel. That's how tall the raspberry plants get. And then on the right, inside the tunnel, and you can see they're just massive, producing lots of fruit, 
And then you can pick that fruit in the fall, and you can overwinter those canes on the lower part of the fruit, bring it through the winter in the tunnel, and have another big crop the next spring. And then the third thing we found that you can do is overwinter these tender blackberries and raspberries that normally don't survive in the Northeast because it's too cold. So if you grow these in a tunnel, they do great. So here's our black raspberry planting outside, and you can see all the canes are dead, at least the second year canes, the first year canes are growing up, so they're gonna die too next winter. But if you put them in a tunnel like this, let it snow, they're protected. That one little sheet of plastic makes a huge difference in their survival. So we've done this for a number of years. We've compared yields inside the tunnel to outside the tunnel. So you can look at every case, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. The yields inside are so much greater. Uh, one year, two years, second year, same thing. Marketable fruit, much higher. Yields much higher. Size much higher. Same thing, 2010. Big differences in yield and berry weight inside the tunnel versus outside the tunnel. It just goes on and on. I can show you lots and lots of data. Uh, pushing 40,000 pounds per acre equivalent with Chester variety. It's amazing, triple crown did really well. Yeah. yeah. So it takes about four years for these plants to get rev up and get going with full production, but once they get going, uh, they just Go. So these are just some photographs, better than data, looking at pictures, and these are blackberries in the tunnel, and you can just see how they do. And this is in an area that blackberries normally won't grow at all. So, very impressive. Uh, no, we won't talk about that. <laughs> That's another talk. No, no. So, yeah. So you can just see that the yield potential here is pretty phenomenal. And when you look at the costs, you know, it costs about $11,000 to get these tunnels erected. And this tunnel would be 30 by 96 feet, which is about, you know, 1.06 acres. It's pretty small. But, so it's expensive. But when you run the numbers and you look at the production costs, and I've got the budgets here, you can see your expenses start off pretty high. You don't really start picking any fruit until the second year. Uh, and it takes you about four or five years to break even to recover your initial startup cost. And then after that, uh, you don't have very many expenses in these tunnels because you pay for everything. And then you're picking all this fruit and it looks really profitable when you pencil it out into the out years. So we're really excited about tunnels and what sort of advantages they can provide for us. Um, How long do the tunnels last? So the tunnel, the plastic has to be replaced every three years or so. That's what's recommended. The tunnels themselves, the structure, make last you know, forever. So, and so growers are adopting this, and uh, we're really excited to see it because we think it has a lot of potential for the Northeast. And again, we put all this information in a production guide that you can download for free and you know, read all about it, see what we're doing, some of the things we learned from that. And I think these uh, tunnels are really going to become more and more important, particularly with climate change. You may have seen these data here. This is the variation in temperature each year from 1910 till now. So the bigger the bar, the more variation in temperature we have. And this green line you see running through there is sort of the average variation. And you can see that in the last years since like 2000, it's the variation that's really increased. And that's where we run into trouble with these berry crops. They can do pretty well if it's just cold and stays cold. But when you get fluctuating temperatures, that really hurts them a lot. So these covers and tunnels and so forth seem to be able to help moderate that fluctuation somewhat. And I think it's going to help us as we move forward in the future. Now, so Technology and techniques from California and Florida can be used to grow strawberries in colder regions, I think resulting in an overall uh, lower environmental impact. Tremendous advantages to growers in northern climates, particularly as climate variability increases, and I think there's still a long way to go before berry production can really be considered environmentally sustainable, regardless of region. The way we're doing still uses plastics 
I like to be able to figure out ways to get away from all that plastic use. And then, thank you very much for mentioning Spider-Wing Drosophila. <laughs> After we worked for 20 years to get these crops to produce more fruit in the fall, then along comes this invasive insect that really loves fall raspberries and blackberries. It's like, oh, what do we do all this work for? <laughs> so anyway, it's been a problem, it's been a challenge trying to figure out how to manage this invasive pest. Uh, Harvesting a little early sometimes. Harvesting early, and you know what? If you put these fruits in the refrigerator, in the cooler, for a day or two before you sell them, they don't wiggle anymore. Because <laughs> <laughs> customers just don't know they're there. They're really small, and so we found that actually, that actually works really well. Pick as regularly as you can, put the fruit in the cooler, and then sell it. And you yeah, can't see the eggs, and if there's any larvae, you're not moving, you're dead. Nobody's a wiser. Nobody's wiser, <laughs> growers richer, everybody's happy. But you can't keep the software out. You cannot keep, we, yeah. so we have, there is a, a, a netting now that's large enough to exclude, it's small enough to exclude the Drosophila, but large enough to let moisture all go. And some growers are now using that with great success on their blueberries and raspberries and their tunnels. Great success. So it's expensive. As well, most of these things are, but it's amazing how it just shuts out everything. And so you're not only excluding spotting the softball, but you can exclude Japanese beetles and flies and birds and all those other things in one fell swoop, so to speak. So I think we'll see more of these tunnels being, or more of these fabrics being used to exclude these things as opposed to spraying twice a week and stuff that you always tried initially to reduce the impact of that insect. What's an attribute turn of the tunnel? So would you turn in the tunnel? Turn the tunnel for you. Yeah, so if you're just growing berries? Yeah, it would be. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, if you pencil it out, it can be in several thousand dollars per tunnel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, exactly. That's some of my point, yeah. Three, four years you paid for it, and then from there on, it's, it's good. And, and we've had, we've fruited blackberries in tunnels for 15 years, the same plant, with no uh, decline in production. They just they keep going. For some reason, outside, you don't get that long. Like after seven, eight years, they start to go down. But in these tunnels, they just come back every year, every year. And we're not fertilizing them. They're already so vigorous. Why do we want to put fertilizer on them? They're already so big and massive. So what we do is we incorporate compost before we plant. And that seems to be enough fertility just to last them for however long they're going to be. I mean, it's extending considerably. Yeah, we're late comers to it. And there's places around the world uh, where it's for, go on Google Maps, get Spain, look at the bottom of Spain, uh, and you'll see, stick it out in the Mediterranean, you'll see a white image, like there's white on the map. And you think, oh, that must be like, maybe that's sand or a big deposit of sand or something like that. Start scrolling down on Google, get closer and closer to it, and you'll see it's just, it's tunnels. Full of strawberries, massive amounts of tunnels full of strawberries. It's really incredible. Yeah. I think we have like two more minutes, but we'll go to thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have one from online. Okay. Um, and so they wondered this was back to the strawberry production. When deflowering in October, did the increase in spring crop compensate for the loss in the fall crop? Yeah, so that's what we're. Uh, we're doing that right now. We've got that very experiment going where we've been harvesting. We're going to see now how much loss we have in the fall where that's made up in the spring. It's a really good question. That's a question we have, and we're going to have an answer probably next July. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. That's a good one. I have a question kind of related to that. So it seems like the first year in general is a lot more productive than the second year as far as the total amount of fruit we get. So for the grower, is it really that economically beneficial to, to bring them a second year or to just replant? Is that why a lot of times it's annual in California? So, so you're, you're right. It may not be nearly as profitable to hold those over into the second year, but what it can do for you is give you fruit in June, early July on those same plants before that crop comes in. So you, the, the it helps annual crop comes in, so it evens out the production. Uh, if you want strawberries in June, July, sure, you could tear those plants out and grow June strawberries, but then you're managing two different crops. So you can do it, and that might be more economical in the long run. Once we find out, we'll, we'll know. 
but uh, at least right now, you can just grow with that one variety, get Albi in the first year, August, September, October, overwinter it, and then fill in June and July with one variety. We're gonna need to go ahead and stop and do other questions. You can come up to the front and ask him some of this. Thank you. Thank you.